All right, you can have a seat. It's kind of ringing. You working on it? Okay. Um, all right, well, we're just going to jump right back in. If you have not been with us for the last couple of weeks, we're in this passage in 1 Corinthians. It's a really familiar passage. We talked last week about some of the challenges that we have with this passage is that we have this word love that we use that's universal. And so, you know, we love our children and we love fried chicken and we love our sports team and we love our neighbors. And so we have this word that we use for all these things. And another challenge is that as soon as you hear love is patient and kind and doesn't envy and boast, you immediately think of how you've heard this read at weddings. So we tend to default to romantic love, romantic love causes us to think about feelings, and we often think of love as a response to our feelings, um, when love is, in fact, an act of the will. We're choosing to love, and so it's, we talked about those challenges and how we have to, as the people of God, put on love, and that this passage is actually not, even though it's, that it can be true of husbands and wives, it's not talking about that. It's talking about love within the family of God, within the body of Christ. And so we said last week, we want to acknowledge our feelings. We we don't want to let them drive the car. We don't want to be led by our feelings, but we want to acknowledge our feelings. And so when we find ourselves being resentful or irritable, like it tells us love is not, (laughs) it's a a check engine light for us. (laughs) It, it, It causes us to say, what is that? What's behind that? What's going on there? And just we're allowing God to do what we just prayed. We're allowing him to expose our lives to open us up, that we want to be seen for who we are, we want to see him for who he is, and that when we see him for who he is, when we know and understand the Father's love, we cannot help but respond in loving him and loving others in that way. And so rather than a list of things of love is not this and love is this, now go try harder and do this thing, we go, no, no, the starting place is a revelation of the Father's love for us. And we understand his love we're able to love with that kind of love. And so with that in view, last week we just summed everything up by talking about love and the concept of time. That love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love allows us to give people space to grow up and to learn. We're going to talk about that more. In fact, I just want to encourage you next week, we're going to be here with all of the teachers and administrators from our school and we're going to be talking about the gift of the next generation and pouring into the next generation. And we're talking about, we're going to talk about maturing in love, all of us together. That's what happens when we have a good perspective of time. Is we, we understand that we're all growing, we're all learning. Today we're going to talk about love and truth. In the scripture that we just read, it says that love does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And so we're going to just use these phrases to kind of shape the conversation. Love does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love is not arrogant or rude, and love does not insist on its own way. We live in a culture in which living out your truth and being true to yourself is the anthem that we hear proclaimed all the time. In fact, I just encourage you to put that lens on, that filter on, and and find it in almost every movie and every song, and everything that is held up. Go live your truth, find what your identity is, and then live it out to the fullest. In fact, the arc of every, uh, of nearly every movie that you'll see, even kids' movies, will be that. There's this truth that you need to live to be true to yourself, and there's something or someone getting in the way of that, and you need to push past that so that you can be who you truly are. It's everywhere. It's the anthem of our culture. It's the water that we swim in. It's It's everywhere. And yet what that does is it puts people, it puts us at the very center. If I'm searching to live out my truth, then I'm putting myself at the center of the story. And so as we are challenged to think about what it means to be people who are loving, it is the essence of what we are to be. It is what endures to the very end is love. What we are to be as the people of God, we have to understand that we are not the center of the story, that God is the center of the story. And these two words that Paul is using here, wrongdoing, translated wrongdoing and truth, he uses these same two words in his letter to the church in Rome. A church that was dealing with a lot of the same things in their community that we were dealing with. The same, there's nothing new under the sun. 
the same temptation to sin sexually, the same temptation to use you know, power to control people, the same temptation to find comfort in wealth and, and cause it to alienate you from other people. And he uses these same two words. And so the very beginning of his letter, I want you to see these words again. This word is translated, where it's translated wrongdoing and truth in 1 Corinthians, it's translated unrighteousness and truth here. Look at it. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The Apostle Paul is writing, kind of setting the stage for them to understand the story that they're in. And he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So this this desire to be true to self actually causes you to suppress and to alienate and to set aside what is true. He goes on a few verses later. We're going to pick up in verse 20, 21. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this continual pressing inside causes us to actually walk in darkness. And in verse 22, it says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now I want us to just stop. You can just keep the verse on the screen. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. What I want you to hear is that in the name of love, in the name of wanting to honor somebody and hold somebody up, in fact, the whole idea of taking people who are marginalized and holding them up is at its very heart a Christian value. Like, that's not a cultural value. Like, Rome was not trying to hold people up. That's not something that we find in, internally in and of ourselves to, to take our wealth, to take our position, to take anything in which we've been blessed with and use it to serve other people. No, that's a, that's a Christian value. That's something that says deny yourself. And actually, in denying yourself and in loving Christ first, you use everything you can to hold people up. But that can only happen when Christ is at the center. So it's claiming to be wise... They became fools, and it feels so right in the moment in wanting to love somebody and wanting to affirm them to say what you think in your heart is true and what you want to live out, go do that. It feels, it it can feel so right in the moment. Now here's this pressing on us. Love does not delight in wrongdoing. It, It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, it rejoices in truth. So love has to be connected with what is true. It says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling man and birds and animals and creeping things. It was about an exchange of glory. They exchanged the glory of God, him being central, and they replaced it with these idols of their day. And this idol of our day of finding truth inside of ourselves. He goes on to talk about how they did that and how it played out in sexual sin. And if we think in in the day and age in which we live, the place that's at at the very root of finding meaning and identity is being true to your sexual identity, your gender identity, finding that in and of yourself. And if you're here and you're searching and you're seeking, you're asking questions, we want you to behold and see the love of Jesus today. So even just in this, even though we're not going on and on and we're not going to expound on it anymore, I want you to just as a baseline know that that's what happens when we look in and of ourselves and we try to find truth in and of ourselves and it's always changing and it's always shifting and it actually becomes for us not a firm foundation to stand on. It becomes the shaking ground that's always, that's always shifting. It causes us not to actually find meaning but to be disoriented, <laughs> to be always looking for the next truth. And so when we think about being people of love, we think about people who have surrendered our lives to the lordship of Christ, it's we're saying these things don't define us. We don't find identity in them. And so as the people of God, when you think all the way back to the church that was being written about in Rome to today, we practice a discipline like fasting because we're saying we don't, have to be, we don't have to make food our master. We can actually deny ourselves of food so that we can seek God and his will. Or the gift of celibacy. 
People saying, I actually don't need sex to define me. That's not where I find my identity. Even life itself. The Christians in Rome were being sent to the Colosseum to be ripped apart. Why? Because they were saying, even life itself does not define me. I don't even need that to find meaning. My life can be taken from me, and I will still know who I am (laughs) because my life is rooted and grounded in Christ. Tim Keller said it this way, and I I, I quoted him last week, and there was a, he's a pastor who served for decades in, in New York City and just recently passed away. There was a memorial service just this past week for him. I think he, he frames what is a bullseye for us today. He says, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we can't really hear it. So here we have two things to avoid. We don't want harshness, which is truth without love. It's just berating people. This is what's true. This is what's true. This is what's true without a foundation or in an environment of committed love. It's harsh. But on the other ditch is we don't want sentimentality, which is what happens when we love people but without truth because it keeps us in denial. It's unloving. If you, you know, you can find someone who will agree with you about anything. But saying to someone who wants to be true to themselves, go and do that, when that truth is actually going to lead them to death, is the most unloving thing you could do for them. And so you might call that love, but that's just maybe a smiling face. It's sentimentality. It's not true love. That's why the wounds of a friend, Proverbs says, can be trusted. Because love does not just give us a smiling face. Love comes to us in a moment of error and says, this is what is true. This is what is going to bring you life. Keller sums it up this way. God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness about who we are and also radical, unconditional commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and repent. The conviction and repentance moves us to to cling to and rest in God's mercy and grace. This is the message of the gospel. It's radical truthfulness and radical commitment. And so our bullseye as a church, if this is just, this is just one point, we have these phrases from this passage, but there's just one point this morning is that our bullseye as a church is this. This is what we want to aim for. It's secure love, committed love, an environment of committed love that allows truth to be understood and applied. It's an environment of secure love that's face-to-face. We said last week we're moving face-to-face with each other, a secure love that is face-to-face with each other that says, I am here for you. I am not going anywhere. But then in that commitment says, this is what is true and right. And as we think about that, we have to hold up that the enemy of this kind of face-to-face interaction is isolation. Sometimes we're, we can think that the enemy of love and unity is disagreement. And so we seek to just not be disagreeable with people. But the enemy of, of love is not disagreement, it's isolation. It's anything that would cause you to pull away from people. This passage is calling us together as the people of God to come to him. The enemy of love is isolation. We can disagree and still walk together in unity. You know that? We can actually wrestle over things and actually come to a greater understanding of what is true when there's disagreement. But environment that doesn't create any any place of security and commitment is when people become isolated. And this passage is calling us to the exact opposite of that. It's calling us to -to face-to-face love. And what that means is that we have to be willing to have difficult conversations with each other. And I can look back in ministry, in marriage, in friendship, and tell you failure after failure after failure as a result of 
not wanting to or being willing to have a difficult conversation. Can you relate to that? Why don't we do that? Why, don't we, why aren't we willing to step into a difficult conversation? We, we want to be comfortable. We bow to the idol of comfort. We just like to be comfortable. We don't want someone else to not like us or to see us less. We bow to the idol of the fear of man. But there's an invitation that God has given us. This is part of the reason why we move communion to the end. Is that there may be something that the Holy Spirit just shines a light on right now in your life. That there's a, there's a hard conversation that needs to be had. There's some sin that needs to be confessed. There's maybe an area of um, hurt where you've been hurt by someone and you need to bring it to light so that a root of bitterness doesn't, doesn't grow up inside of you. Whatever that is, we have to be willing to have difficult conversations with each other. As iron sharpens iron, one life sharpens another life. Even in the friction, even in the difficult moments is actually how God forms us and shapes us. And so I want to just, I'm going to give you kind of a brief aside because I felt like I needed to communicate these passages today. They're in your handout. I'm going to put a slide up on the screen. I want you to go back because in this, in this call for love and truth, I want you to go back. You can look at the passages. I'm just going to paraphrase them. But when we think of coming to truth as a people, we need to see that even in the discernment of what is true, that it is rooted in community. It's not rooted in isolation and individualism. It's rooted in coming together in a community. So here's some examples. When someone sins against you, you're to go to them. But even in going to them, if there's still disagreement there, you're to bring two or three with you. Because one person doesn't get to determine what was true and right in that situation. You need other eyes on it. We have blind spots. Same thing with leaders. You don't get to bring a charge against elders except for on two or three witnesses. No one gets to say, no, this is what's true, this is what's right. It, it takes community, it takes eyes to see it, to discern what is true. Same is true in pr prophecy. So later on in this letter, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. First of the Thessalonians 5, we're not going to despise prophecy, prophecy, but we're going to test everything and we're going to hold fast to what is good. So even if the living God reveals something to you in this divine way, how amazing. Not one of us gets to just speak on behalf of God. It has to be weighed. We don't come to an understanding of truth without weighing it together in community. This happened in the teaching and the practice of the scriptures in Acts chapter 15. It says that the apostles and elders gathered together and they were gathering together. It's a really great story. There's tons of wisdom to pull out of it. But they gather together because they need to determine whether or not God is saying that all of the Gentiles need to become Jews before they become Christians. So do all the men need to be circumcised and go through this rite of passage and become Jewish first and then become Christians? Now, here's what I want you to see. It says in there very specifically that Paul and Barnabas had already had this revelation as they'd been preaching to the Gentiles. Peter in Acts 10 had already had this, uh, this you know, vision from God where God had spoken to him. And these were apostles of God. Like, if anyone had claim to say, this is what is true and right, and yet they came together with all the things that God had spoken and said, what is, what is the Lord saying? What is, what is wisdom as we move forward? There's a passage in Acts 17. It's often quoted as an encouragement to be people of God who are in the word and coming back to the scriptures. And it says this, it says, now the, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now we read that and we go, awesome, they're, they're receiving the word with eagerness, which is how we need to be receiving it. God, speak to us, we're hungry, we want you to speak. But it says, then they're every day searching the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. Now we read that, and we read it through our modern lens, and we think, I'm hearing a message, and then I'm going off by myself, and I'm opening my Bible, and I'm reading it. Now, how amazing that we have the scriptures in our language, and that we can read it. What a grace and a gift to us. It's why we have a Bible reading plan that we use. It's why we encourage us every day before you turn on your news. In fact, we're going to talk about this next week as we raise up the next generation. We don't want them on social media, on the news. Get out, we want them to open up their, we want them to open up the word every day and seek God first. 
So praise God that we have this. Praise God that we have study tools and that we have sermons and everything available to us. But I want you to hear this. The Brians didn't have their own copy of the scriptures. They didn't have their own private scrolls. When it says they searched the scriptures daily, it was speaking of community. They were coming together to examine the word of God. And again, think of what the enemy could do to isolate us. In trying not to be disagreeable, we actually pull aside on our own. But coming to an understanding of truth, rejecting what is evil and coming to an understanding of truth, meeting together in love, actually requires a coming together. So one of the phrases that I've heard that's been kind of one of those like, sometimes people will repeat phrases that become a little bit of like a check engine light for me as a pastor, just like our emotions are a check engine light for, uh, for us individually. One of those check engine light words that, that's come up is, well, that's not how I interpret that passage. And so one of the reasons we have, we're, we're, we're launching again our roundtable time, which we're so excited about, we're going to intentionally have some time where we're going to be going through new content, but a lot of times we're actually going to be doubling back on content that we've already gone over as a church so that we can understand how to interpret scripture well. So one of the things you have to ask is what are the rules of interpretation you're using for that packet passage? Because you want to use those rules in this other passage. We don't get to pick and choose. And there's sometimes we can come with a desire to understand God's word and the desire to heed to it, but very quickly feel it, very quickly because of our feelings or because of our blind spots, we get into a place where we go, well, I'm just going to set aside that scripture. I'm going to interpret that one differently. I don't really like how that one rubs up against me. And it's actually when we're face to face with each other that we get to say together as we open the word, Lord, what is your word saying to us and how are we to live? Oftentimes the tools that we have because we have the scripture and because we have sermons and even beyond that, we don't even have sermons. We have sermons that have been spliced up into YouTube videos that are only 30 seconds long or a minute long. And what it, what it can sometimes do is it, it brings a kind of tribalism into the church. I'm like, yeah, you have that argument. I have this argument. You have this thing you're going to say. I have this thing that I'm going to say because I've listened to this thing. I know this phrase. And it lacks humility it can subtly cause us to think that to disagree or to come up with, with two different perspectives, we want to avoid that, and then the enemy has won because he's isolated us. But actually, when there's friction in a conversation is actually the place where we oftentimes learn the most, where we're actually able to see what is true. And so we think about these hard conversations, these times where we're face-to-face, let's move on and see what are the pitfalls that we, don't, that we want to avoid. Here's one. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love is not arrogant or rude. Perhaps there's a truth about God and about his ways or his commands that you understand, but the way that you're walking it out is not in love. And for the sake of the argument, I would just say, because you're saying, we're, we're very rarely 100% right. Okay? And we're going to see that a little bit later in the passage. We we see through a gla- the, the mirror dimly. We're very rarely 100% right. But for the sake of the argument, let's just say you're 100% right on a situation, on a particular point. What would cause you to be arrogant or rude? I want to just give you two things to consider. Number one, you care more about being right than you care about the other person. You care more about being right than you care about the other person. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding but only in expressing his opinion. That's why we have to engage each other in seeking first to understand and then to be understood. Because we're engaging with with love in view. I want to love this person well. Not avoiding the truth, because that's sentimentality, but also not being harsh and just trying to insert truth into a situation. So we care more about right than being right than care about the other person. The second thing is that you think that you've earned that truth. <clears throat> you think that you have earned what you understand. You think you've gotten it by your own effort. And hey, maybe, maybe it has been by your faithful study. Maybe it's because you've sat in teachings like this. We're not saying that this is a, this is, this is a great thing we're holding up, that we're sitting under the teaching of God's word. But we have to understand that every single revelation that we have is a gift from God. 
And that oftentimes, the things that we really, really understand and that we know about God and his character has, has been forged in times of suffering and pain. And so it is with that humility like that Paul pray, prays in, in Ephesians 1.17, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. This is so encouraging when we think of wanting truth for other people. Isn't it a good thing to want truth and life for other people? But have you ever tried to just do that by convincing people? And it just not work, it didn't work very well? Like, I know what they need. They just need me to come at them with a better argument, and then they'll get it. Have you ever tried that? And then you walked away and you realized, that didn't work as well as I hoped. I remember a moment when, <laughs> early on in our marriage where Jackie was like, you know, you won that argument, but you didn't actually win anything. And I was like, you're right. <laughs> that is wisdom that I need to hold on for the rest of my life. So even assuming we're 100% right on something and we desire someone else to see it, what a different perspective it has when we approach it with humility and say, God, give us the wisdom of revelation. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. That's what we want. So love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Other ways that this is translated as love isn't self-seeking. The King James translates it, it does not behave unseemingly. Unseemly, it says. It isn't self-first. Now, I, I think we can immediately think of this as just, just, just being selfish. But I think in the context of the rest of the passage, it's more than just that. There's more playing on in all this than just selfishness. So we just got back from a road trip with our kids, and maybe you've experienced this where everybody wants to find the best seat in the car. So they're always just fighting for that seat because they want their territory and their space. And so we think love is not that. It's, it's selfless. It's not selfish. But there's, there's more at play here when we think of relating as the body of Christ. It's not self-first. In other words, it doesn't engage the world through the lens of self. And when we think about this, I want, us, I want us to just hold up the, 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 the temptation that each of us can have to fall into legalism. And legalism can kind of rear its ugly head in all kinds of different ways. I mean, it can be that we don't understand the spirit of the law. Um, we fall, we're following the letter of the law that, we, that we're taking maybe some principle that God has given and we're missing that we have a principle giver. We have a law giver. We have one who's good. We, we take him out of the equation and we're just looking at principles. Another way that we can do that is we can go further than the scriptures go and create some kind of framework which causes a certain group of people to be in and a certain group of people to be out. And this happens real... We, we do this because we have this constant need to self-justify ourselves. So we want to constantly... The, the, the story we're playing in our head is constantly telling ourselves that we're right. And if we think that there might be some sin involved, we're constantly trying to downplay that. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just human nature. It's what we do. And so here's how that might look. That might look by, uh, you know, having a command like, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You said, wow, that's a, that is a profound, huge call to fathers. You could spend your entire life unpacking that verse. But then we go further than that, and we say, it means that you have to school your kids this way, and it means that you're your rhythms in your home need to look like this, and this is how much screen time your kid can have if they have it at all, and this is what this area of your family needs to look like. We begin to set up all those parameters, and we create in and of ourselves a, these are the people that are in, and these are the people that are out. And if you're doing that, just, I just want to give you a heads up. If you're doing that, you will never do that if you are not the in person. Like, you're never going to create a framework where you're outside of it. <laughs> because legalism is always causing us, we're always doing that to self-justify. So we create an in-out framework we're the ones in, and these other people are out. And so last week, we, as we started off at this passage, we just, you know, it was the reminder that if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. That's, that's when we bring, that's harshness. That's just trying to bring truth, and it's, it's actually without love. It says this, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains but have not love, I gain nothing. If I give away all that I have and deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. We said last week that 
These are three areas, if we just kind of look at these three, they're areas where we could find identity or meaning. We could actually hold up people who fit these categories. So people that can fathom all mysteries and knowledge. Or maybe we ourselves feel like we're that kind of person. We understand things. People that have faith to move mountains. Those are the people that we praise. Or maybe that's something we find in and of ourselves that we, that we know God has given us this gift of faith in a specific area. Or maybe it's sacrifice. You know, we, we talked about Michaela going to Ecuador and we're praying for her as she prepares. We, we sent Caitlin out last week and so we see people who live with great sacrifice and we can hold those up and say, those are the people that, that really get it. Now, all three of these things are things that God has called us to. He's called, called us to be people who grow in knowledge, people who live by faith, people who live sacrificially. They're all good things, but we, we take one aspect of the character of God, one maybe area where we have revelation, or maybe we are particularly strong, and then we begin to view every single thing through that lens. And again, we create an in-out framework. So yeah, I can't really receive from this other person because they just don't understand this area of truth that they really need to walk in. And it very subtly divides us. And so we, the people who are prone to sacrifice maybe think less of the people that are spending hours and hours in 24-7 prayer this coming weekend. Those who are spending time in prayer who maybe have a revelation of the power of God to change something in a moment or what it looks like to intercede for a group of people or for... Um, or for a city over and over for years and for months, that those people could say, but these people just don't get faith. So I don't, I don't have anything to learn from them. Those who have knowledge, who are able to perfectly discern what things are because of their understanding of the scriptures or their understanding of life could see people who have faith as maybe just being emotional, being lesser than in some way. And so all these things, what they do is they cause us to insist on our own way, to see even the lens of something good and true and right in the church through the lens of our own self and our own experience and the own places where we are strong. But what love does, what secure love does is it invites us into a community where we actually have different strengths that we bring to the table. And so we get to ask the question, of that person who's different than us, what can I learn from them? Every single person in the body of Christ has something for you to learn and gain from. They have something, they have some strength that you don't have. They have some revelation about the character and nature of God, some glimpse of him that you don't have. Paul gets at the heart of this in Philippians 2. He says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Isn't that an incredible call? Count others as more significant than yourselves. And so if we, if our starting place is a revelation of who God is, like it's not just trying harder, it's not like just, Lord, just make us more loving people. But let's start with you in the center. There's as, 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 as this argument goes on in, in 1 Corinthians 13, this rally cry, this, this, this call to be love, one who's loving and not, not a, a clanging symbol. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The mirrors of ancient times weren't like mirrors that we have now. They just used metal. And so if you can think of using something like brass to see your reflection, it's not a perfect reflection. It's saying that we, we see this way dimly. We don't see perfectly. None of us are going to get to heaven and see Jesus face to face and, and all of a sudden have all understanding because we are beholding him and seeing him and go, I nailed it. 
100%. And so do, don't you see that there's a tension here? We don't want to fall into this ditch that, that our culture does where everything is relativistic. Everything is just like whatever goes and whatever your interpretation is. Whatever. That's not true. There's, a, there's objective truth that we have in the word. But in that their truth is an understanding that we can't be so bold in our seeking truth to not have the humility to know that we see through the mirror dimly and that one day we will behold Jesus and we will see him face to face. And we will know, not in part, we will know fully in everything up until that time, every prophetic word, every teaching from the scripture like we're doing now, every moment of wisdom that you get to have where you're interacting with someone and maybe something you share that is an encouragement completely changes the, the direction of their life. Every time, for those of you who are in, in recovery and you're in a recovery group, I love the, the environment that recovery groups bring because there's a humility there to say, we are people who are in need. Do you see that how... What recovery groups at their, at their best do is people are gathering in humility saying, this is our need. Saying, if I have sobriety, it's because of grace. Like, sobriety today is a gift. And also saying to other people, we're not going to allow you to lie to yourself and walk in a way that's not true. We're not going to control you <laughs> because we can't control you. But we're going to speak the truth in love about this way that we've all known and walked will kill us. Here's the way of life. Isn't it amazing to think of what an environment, when the church does that, when it's like maybe groups like that that you've experienced, or maybe it's like a family, if you've, uh, if, if you've been a part of a family that is truly loving, which is what the church should be, where we get to grow up, and one of the, the soils of that is the humility to say, we don't have everything figured out. John was reading this book by a Puritan pastor named Hugh Binning, who's from the 17th century, and any time, you know, any time words have endured for hundreds of years, so he sent this to me and Chris, and I was like, I have to add this. I want to read to you what he says. He says, now, there is one further consideration which might persuade us more to love, that here we know by darkly and in part, and therefore our knowledge at best is but obscure and inevident often subject to many mistakes and misapprehensions of truth because of the obscuring glass we are looking through. And listen to this. And therefore, there must be some latitude of love allowed to one another in this state of imperfection. Do you love that, that phrase? There must be some latitude of love allowed to one another in this state of imperfection, else it is impossible to keep unity. He goes on, what is wanting in knowledge, let us make up in affection and let the gap of difference in judgment be swallowed up by the bowels of mercy, love, and humbleness of mind. As we close, I want to, I told you that through this, these few weeks together that I was going to be kind of coming around some values of us as a church. And one of those is the, value of, the values of diversity and unity. Earlier on in this letter in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit being given out because this is, of course, one of the failures of the church in Corinth was they were using spiritual gifts as a means of elevating themselves above other people. And so he's reminding them that there is a diversity of gifts. And this word uh, variety could be translated diversity. So it's used, we don't really think of talking about people in terms of variety, but things, in this case, gifts. And so just the word diversity is, is this word here. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So we have this diverse group of people who've been called together and transformed by Christ's love. And we're called to actually be not isolated and separate from each other, but called to walk together in unity. And here's the challenge with that it's so easy to hang out with people that are just like us. It just is. It doesn't matter what it is. People are in the same season of life, who kind of have the same sort of job that you have, who have the same kind of background that you have. Like, it's just easy to do that. But what God has called us to do is something so much more rich and so much more beautiful as we walk in truth together as the people of God. And what happens is it's like that game, you know those games where 
the picture is hidden and card by card gets un, un, turned over and you start to see more and more of what the picture is behind it, do you realize all of life, we're doing that? It's like all of us, through the gifts of each other, we're uncovering a greater understanding of what we will eventually see face to face when we behold Jesus. And I love, I love that I didn't even know that Aru was going to read the passage of Scripture. I saw it this morning. <laughs> I was out on a run, and I was praying, and I looked down at the, at, the, at the order of service and saw that Aru was on here. I thought, Lord, you're so kind to put together this service the way you do in these ways. Because here's Aru, this beautiful Indian-American woman who, uh, in her Indian-American accent, is reading 1 Corinthians 13, who, in her, uh, in her marriage to Alan, her, their, their wedding to this day for my family, is one of the highlights of our lives. Like, not even kidding. And we get to hear the scriptures read from someone whose story is different than ours. But you know, do, do, do you know that as we are beholding, or as we're having truth revealed to us and we're walking as people of truth and we're, we're displaying that to the world, it's so much richer. When we hear diversity, it's kind of a buzzword these days, so we have to define what we mean. Did you understand it's more than just racial diversity, ethnic diversity? It's so much, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's men and women, and young and old, and mature and maturing, and strong, physically strong and weak, and prophets and teachers, as there was in Antioch, and those who have the gift of intercession, and those who have the gift of administration. Is all of us coming together. And as John read at the beginning, it's all of us with the voice that we've been giving, singing with one voice, and actually sounding like one voice that proclaims to the world. Romans 15, 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. I'm going to just give a moment in the quiet for you to just ask the Lord what you needed to hear today. I'm going to read on as just with our heads bowed in Philippians 2. It's the continuation of what I read earlier, that in humility we would count others as more significant than ourselves. It's not our default. And our starting place cannot be just trying harder. Our starting place must be Jesus. And so the passage goes on. Let each of you Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you humbled yourself to the point of death, even death on the cross.
we come now to the table to remember that your body was given for us, your blood was poured out for us, that you have invited us into a new covenant, which is a secure love that doesn't go anywhere, that your love for us is constant. And it allows us to see the truth about ourselves even when it's uncomfortable. It allows us to move towards people with what is true and right even when the conversation is uncomfortable. And so we thank you for covenantal love, Lord. We thank you for a promise-keeping love. And we remember it now. And we ask that you would forgive us, Lord, because we have not loved you with our whole heart. And we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. And we ask you'd forgive us of that. Would you just take a moment just to, just in specific confession, if there's a specific thing that came to mind there, of a way that you have not loved well. We just confess that to him. Now you can look up here to me. And just want you to know, I know we're, we're face-to-face in a large room, but this is one of the powers of confession towards other people is that other people get to be the gift of God to you and speaking love back to you. But the word says that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so you get to go to the table of the Lord today as one who is forgiven. Not because of your righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness. And so we say we want to be people of love, it's that we don't want to walk in unrighteousness. We don't want to glory in unrighteousness. We want to glory in the truth and the truth of who he is, of the one who came full of grace and truth. And so we're going to go to the table today. And if you have your elements there, if if you're here and you're searching and seeking and you're asking questions, you don't know Jesus yet as your Lord and Savior, we don't want you to participate in something that doesn't mean anything to you. We don't want you just going through motions. But we would give an invitation to you to surrender to Jesus, to follow him with your life. And you can cry out to him in your seat. You can also come and pray with one of us. And I just had this sense as we were reading earlier that there was someone in here that maybe even you've you've had like a lot of script like a lot of Christian experiences, and so you would consider yourself as a Christian. But something the Holy something the Lord has done today through the reading of the words, you realize Jesus is actually not my Lord and King. I haven't actually surrendered to Him. I've just kind of grabbed on to a bunch of Christian phrases. And if that's you, we just want you to know that today the invitation is there to just say, Jesus, you must be Lord and King of my life. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read the passage, and instead of taking the elements right away when we end, I'm going to give you space to actually look with each other and to say to each other, this is the body of the Lord that was given for you. This is the blood of Christ that was poured out for you. So I'm going to stop. I know that might, I know that might make a little moment uncomfortable, but here's what I want to do. I want to bring a face-to-face element into what we're doing right now. Instead of it just being you look up here, I want you, so it might be the spouse, friend, you might learn it, you might turn to either side of you, but we're just going to stop and I'm going to give you a moment to actually face-to-face say this to each other, okay? For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to turn to neighbor and say, this is the body of the Lord given for you. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Just turn to each other and say, this is the blood of Christ poured out for you.
Now let's stand together. The band can come. The prayer team can come. And I want to read these last few verses to you. We could sum up everything we talked about, about an environment of secure love, where we get to hear truth and understand it and walk it out in obedience by the two words that we just read in 1 Corinthians 11, new covenant. Jesus has established a new covenant with us, and it's a secure promise that is forever. And this is what he says. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We get to proclaim all that he is until we see him face to face.